And now it's time for us to discuss more of these headlines and simple keywords with Adam joining us via Zoom. Uh, good morning, Adam. Well, good morning, Lena, and happy Leap Day. Happy Leap Day. Technically, I read somewhere that even if we skipped work today, there are really no grounds for companies to punish us. <laughs> <laughs> because it doesn't exist? Yes, technically. <laughs> yes, technically. Now, I don't know if you would yeah. be brave enough to take the risk, but I just thought it was funny that we're just looking for any excuse yeah. possible to get a day off. Ah. People will be people, won't they? I mean, you know, find any excuse to avoid work, but we're yeah. here, aren't we? So, yeah, we yeah. are, bright and early. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, let's get started. We have a lot of grounds to cover. I mean, we're already here. Uh, the government proposed deadline for striking doctors to return to work. Uh, let's get started. This is our first keyword of the day. B-Day. So today is the government's deadline for trainee doctors on strike to return to work without facing legal action. Although there are no clear signs of widespread return yet, some residents have reportedly come back to work. What's the latest, Adam? Right, so it does seem to have uh, shaken the feathers or rattled the feathers of some of the residents who might fear some kind of legal repercussions. But uh, as of yet, it's not really safe to say that uh, uh, the majority of residents will adhere to this deadline. There is speculation that more may come back during the March 1st holiday period. Uh, but again, there is speculation uh, and a bit of uh, skepticism as to the scale of it. Now, the government has completed preparations for legal proceedings to begin in March, actually, including filing complaints against, uh, against current and former executives of the KMA. They've done so for five officials already. Whether more complaints will be filed remains to be seen, as well as visiting the homes of some residents to deliver work resumption orders directly as well. Some officials from the ministry apparently, uh, reportedly visited some residents' homes yesterday to deliver the orders directly. Now, this approach targets residents who have avoided orders sent by uh, mail or text uh, and they mostly target kind of the uh, upper echelons of these uh, associations of the interns and residents. Now, uh, as the deadline approaches, some residents did start returning, as you said. While not all have made clear decisions, some residents are considering returning, driven by uh, financial needs, uh, for one, as well as pressure from the government. Of course, they handed in their resignations and they basically uh, quit their jobs. Uh, so, of course, they are out of a job, so they're unemployed technically during this period of strike. So for some of them, um, it might be a bit of a struggle financially. Uh, in some hospitals, there are residents who have submitted resignation letters, but actually continue to work on site as well. So it's mm. not all of them who handed in resignations note that uh, uh, did actually walk off. Now, hospital professors note that while there are many department-specific differences, the overall situation has not uh, significantly uh, changed. So mm. you might see some departments where a lot of the residents have returned, but of course in other areas, uh, there's still a, a vacuum and mm. vacancies. Yeah. Well, elaborate a little bit further on this story with Dr. Tan in our second hour, because I, I know we like to say simplify it with keyword news and headlines because we're limited on time. Mm -hmm. But the idea that all striking doctors are on the same page is misleading, right? I mean, they all have a personal and professionally different list of objectives, if you will. Not all yeah. are against the expansion of medical school quota, uh, but just to what extent probably comes into question. Yeah, I mean, a lot of them are in different departments, different right, fields of right. medicine as well. So each of those areas, of course, will have their own needs and their own demands, uh, or they might be content with what's uh, uh, already happening or not really bothered by it. So, yeah, of course, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult kind of, uh, it's hard to put a kind of a, a blanket uh, yeah. assumption on these kind of things but mm. uh, at, at the moment anyway mm. uh, the walkout and the strike is still uh, well underway at the moment we'll have to see later on in the day just exactly how many if any return to work all right let's move on to our second keyword of the day Tommy Splinkin. So the top diplomats of South Korea and the U.S. will hold talks in Washington soon uh, what's on the agenda there do we know what they'll be discussing yeah, soon being that probably they're in the talks right now as we speak. <laughs> yes, so no no real updates until those talks are <laughs> over yet. But uh, it will be there 
uh, first bilateral in-person meeting uh, since Joe took office last month. Uh, the main agenda, of course, as always, will be North Korea. Uh, Foreign Minister Chuk Taeol will meet with U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken to emphasize, or our meeting, uh, uh, to emphasize the solid U.S. alliance, South Korea alliance, in response to provocations from North Korea. The pair are expected to exchange views on maintaining a firm joint defense posture between the allies and continuously enhancing the execution power of extended deterrence. Now, additionally, the meeting is expected to discuss further trilateral cooperation, including Japan. Both sides are also likely to discuss the military cooperation between North Korea and Russia, which is of concern for Seoul and Washington. Uh, this meeting is also anticipated to focus on dispelling concerns of a rift in the U.S.-South Korea alliance due to Donald Trump being uh, re-elected. Uh, the meeting is also expected to strengthen cooperation for economic security under a joint effort to enhance the two countries what's known as Global Comprehensive Strategic Alliance. Now, discussions may also include concerns of Korean companies regarding the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act and the CHIPS Act. Choi is likely to request the U.S. to address uncertainties again related to these laws. So we'll have to see uh, what Blinken has to say about that. But that has those laws have been kind of an underlying kind of uh, issue and hurdle between um, kind of furthering the mm. alliance and strengthening the alliance between Seoul and Washington. So we'll have to see uh, both sides, uh, or the US anyway, seems open to the idea of trying to make some leeway or some sort of concession or uh, for uh, Korea in terms of those laws. We'll, but we'll have to see what kind of actual policies or right. adjustments they make. I mean, there are already acts, right? IRA is an Inflation Reduction Act, the CHIPS Act, right? If, if it's already intact, it's not as if they can scrap yeah. it, but they can certainly make wiggle room to make exceptions right. for their closest allies. We'll wait and see, as you've said, because the meeting is well underway. <laughs> yeah. I don't expect you to be a fly on the wall there. <laughs> I can't, I'm not in sync with the meeting at the moment, unfortunately, so, but maybe tomorrow we'll have some updates. All right, let's move on to our third keyword of the day. Low fertility rate. So the unprecedented low uh, birth rate continues, setting yet another record low for the number of births and total fertility rate last year. Usually Q4 numbers are relatively low, but even taking into that consideration, I mean, we're looking at numbers that's comparable to only war-torn Ukraine. So it's dire, and the rate at which this is falling is actually alarming, too. Tell us the details. Yeah, so this is, of course, nothing new. We sound like broken records, but uh, just a different angle and updated numbers on it. Uh, Korea saw uh, the country's social fertility rate hit a new record low of 0.72 last year. Uh, last year's fertility rate was again the world's lowest, breaking the record marks of the year earlier. So it broke its own record, actually. Uh, the total fer uh, fertility rate measures the average number of children a, a woman is expected to give birth to in her lifetime. Uh, it recorded 0.82 in the first quarter of last year, but kept falling quarter after quarter. In the last quarter, it recorded 0.65. It marks also the first time the country's quarterly total fertility rate has dipped below. 0.7. Now, for a population to hold steady, that number should be 2.1. So you can just see the vast difference there. Now, worst yet, the country's number of births also hit a historic low of 230,000 in 2023. That's down just under 8% from the year prior, and it's half from a decade ago. Now, COVID-19 was largely blamed for the accelerated fall in the country's births, uh, according to Statistics Korea. It said during during the pandemic, the number of marriages plummeted, which had a spillover effect on the country's births last year. The agency, however, projects a rebound in newborns next year or a year after uh, next, as the number of marriages has picked up since late 2022. And now the government uh, pins high hopes on parents in their early 30s to have uh, more children. Apparently, they make up uh, the largest proportion of the population um, of married uh, population that uh, could have children, but many demographic experts remain skeptical about whether the government's hopes can be realized given the current decline in both fertility and birth rates. Now, the birth rate per age group decreased across all age groups under 45, 
grave. Ironically, the birth rates for ages uh, um, for the uh, 20s and 30s were actually the lowest. So the mm. government's hopes of that are kind of diminished uh, because of those uh, data at the moment. Uh, the birth rates for ages 45 and above remain similar uh, to the previous year. Uh, now, the decrease in birth rates was particularly notable, yes, among the women in their late 20s and early 30s. Also, even when younger generation couples get married, many of them choose not to have children at all as well. So that's adding to concerns uh, of the issue. Okay, so the phenomenon was reported in detail on the BBC particularly. Uh, it wants to maybe go a little bit deeper, look at the fundamental issues of why. Why then young couples and young women are inclined to skip having children altogether? What did they have to say on the issue? Right. So the report was basically a, a series of basically interviews with mm. mothers uh, or aspiring mothers here in Korea. But uh, it cited critics saying that those drafting low birth rate policies are simply not listening to the needs of the youth and women in the country. It says women in Korea are being presented with kind of a trade off, having a career or a family. And increasingly, they are choosing a, a career. Now, the BBC acknowledged housing costs as a global issue, but identified the cost of private education as a unique aspect uh, of Korea. It quoted one mother as saying that Korea is not a place where children can actually live happily because of extreme competition. We see many young children in early elementary school years go mm. from one academy to the other after school. And by the time they return home, it's 8 p.m. and they have to basically go to bed uh, almost straight away. We so, even have a name um, for it. It's called Hagwan Beng Beng right? You go from one place right, to the next yeah. and you go from these academies to the other. And it starts incredibly early to get into, yeah. for example, prestigious uh, private academies or private preschools, uh, it's it's a strenuous process. Yeah, so if it's not tough to get into a, a school that your parents want or that is good for the uh, children already, getting it, there's another competition and another roadblock uh, to try and get into these academies as well. And it, if there is a, a term that's coined for that phenomenon, then it tells that there is a bit of an issue regarding it. Now, uh, the BBC highlighted that while Korea's economy has rapidly advanced over the past 50 years, pushing women into higher education and the workforce and fostering ambition, the roles of wife and mother have not really evolved at the same uh, pace as mm. well. So, yeah, I mean, that's just a gist of what the report had to say. Uh, so for those of you interested, uh, it is a, a long, lengthy report and just uh, coming from the mouths of the mothers and aspiring mothers in Korea. It was an interesting read. All right. So let's move on to our fourth keyword of the day. Gender disclosure. So the Constitutional Court has ruled that the current medical law banning doctors from revealing the gender of a fetus before the 32nd week of pregnancy is unconstitutional. So expecting mothers could find out earlier. Tell us more. Yeah. Uh, so if you're listening from overseas or from the Western nations, you might be asking, what is this all about? <laughs> Context was, required. Right, yeah, right. Yeah, because usually uh, parents usually, you know, they choose whether to they want the the gender of their babies yeah. to be revealed or not beforehand. Doctors yeah, don't get to decide right. that. Laws don't get right. to decide that. <laughs> right. But uh, yeah, uh, in a six to three decision, uh, so it wasn't unanimous, the court ruled it was unconstitutional to, con to uh, conceal the gender as it infringes on the parent's right to know. Now, the law has been abolished after 37 years. Now, according to the second clause of the Medical Services Act, Article 20, medical professionals are prohibited from informing the pregnant woman, her family members, or any other people of the sex of the fetus before 32 weeks of pregnancy. Now, the regulation was first implemented to resolve sex imbalance by preventing abortions of female fetuses caused by a strong preference for sons in the kind of, you know, widespread Confucian belief that males uh, carry on family lineage uh, in Korea. Now, the court justified its decision by pointing to societal, uh, societal changes, including the advancement of uh, gender equality and the diminishing preference for male children. Actually, nowadays, I think most parents prefer to have daughters rather than <laughs> sons because apparently they take care of the parents later on in life better than <laughs> sons do. We're just overall I'm, better, my, don't you see? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm one guilty party of that, I must say. And so, yeah, I need to get my game going. <laughs> but, uh, so yeah, keeping up with the trend, so to speak, they thought maybe they could exactly. scrap it. Okay. Uh, the kind of cultural trend has changed mm -hmm. as well as not the kind of old-fashioned uh, you know we need uh, all families need the, the male bloodline uh, in the family now the courts uh, um, 
uh, decision is seen as kind of a victory for those who view the ban as an outdated measure and unnecessarily limits parental rights and the professional autonomy of medical practitioners as well. So by allowing the disclosure of fetal gender at any stage of pre uh, pregnancy, the court aims to balance the protection of unborn life with the rights of parents to make informed uh, decisions. Now, however, the ruling has also sparked concerns about the potential for a resurgence in gender selective abortions, despite the country's progress in gender equality, because there are still, of course, a lot of families that still uh, think that they need, you know, a, a male bloodline. Now, the challenge lies in ensuring that the move does not inadvertently lead to an imbalance in the male-female birth ratio while still honouring the court's intention to uphold parental rights and medical ethics. Now, many argue that if an abortion occurs due to the fetus's sex, it is the act of abortion that actually should be regulated by the state, not the disclosure of fetal sex. Of course, Korea has very strict abortion uh, laws but uh, of course a lot of people find loopholes to it yeah all right Anna, i don't mean to rush you but our final <laughs> keyword of the day Special education zone. So the government will designate six metropolitan cities and 43 local areas as pilot special education zones to contribute to perhaps a more balanced regional development can you run us through the plan yeah, so these zones will be where local governments and educational offices will kind of work with the local universities as well as industries to autonomously uh, create educational uh, policies. The central government will basically provide the additional umbrella support for, say, budget and deregulation. And it basically aims to bridge the education gap and create conditions so that young people will want to stay in these kind of rural or areas outside of the capital region. Uh, there will be leading cities such as Busan, Daegu, Gwangju and Daejeon, the major cities that will lead the trial. They'll receive 3 billion won uh, and 10 billion won in funding uh, uh, and uh, other kind of local governments that weren't selected this time round will be evaluated every year to maybe be included in May, which is the next kind of application period. Uh, this is all part of the government's plan to try, you know, uh, spread uh, uh, the kind of industrial um, prospects to outside the capital region. Thank you so much, Adam. We'll speak to you again tomorrow. <laughs> You're very welcome. See you tomorrow. If you're listening to our program using the podcast service, just a reminder that we do go live Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Korea Standard Time. So tune in and help us make the show more informative by giving us your input. See you bright and early on Good Morning Seoul.